Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I'm here with Michael on Double Feature. Hi. And uh, I'm sick today, so I want to watch another fucking John Waters movie. Sounds like a plan. How does this keep happening? Uh, I have no idea. So today we're doing the Man Teeth show, but with older women, mm-hmm. right? That's kind of That's what's That's exactly on. what it is, yeah. It's, uh, what are the movies? Today we're going to do To Die For and Serial Mom. This is one of those double features that I don't know how much I have to say about it, but it's just too fucking perfect of yeah. a pairing. I mean, these are mid-90s dark comedy films about women committing so-called true crimes. Uh huh. It's just so good. We had to do it. So hopefully people watched it at home on yeah. their own. And then they got probably more enjoyment than they're going to get out of this episode. We'll do To Die For first, because the, the whole doing John Waters first thing, that doesn't feel good. No, we'll it's do that weird. Um, we'll do To Die For first. That's the Gus Van Sant film. Mm-hmm. Obviously, after that, we'll do Serial Mom, which mm-hmm. is the John Waters film. And uh, we got chapters. Sure, chapters. So if you happen to not catch one of those movies, what would you do? Uh, you could go ahead and skip right over in your chapters menu. Perfect. To uh, the next film or the end of the show where we tell you that we're doing... Oh, uh, man, we uh, got a huge one. Don't spoil it. Not yet. You have to wait for it. We've been trying to do this movie on the show for a long time. We found something else that we said, fuck it, we're going to pair it with this movie. Right. Uh, I would almost just skip there now and find out. But yeah. don't do that. Listen to uh, listen to the... Yeah, don't uh, spoil it for yourself. Let's do To Die For first. Okay. This one is based on the so-called true story. I'm going to keep saying so-called true story because mm-hmm. I think that's perfect. Of uh, Pamela Smart. And this is actually something of a true story. There was a book called To Die For that was written. And then this is the movie kind of based on that. And I think this is interesting as a Gus Van Sant movie. Because I don't know, it feels, does it feel like Gus Van Sant? Is it halfway There's, there? Yeah, what I think is it? It's, I think that as a Gus Van Sant film, I haven't seen Elephant, as, right? That was what we did on the right, show. Right, we did Elephant. There's your previously on Double Feature sure. thing to kind of compare that to. I haven't seen nearly as many as you, but from what I know is that Gus Van Sant has his films and then he has the films that Matt Damon are in. <laughs> right. Um, Although I wouldn't say that's necessarily true because some of his artsy stuff has Matt Damon That's too. true. But I would definitely say that as far as mainstream goes, this falls just about middle of the road yeah there's enough gus van sant artsy bullshit which take or leave and then there's enough mainstream mainstreamy bullshit (laughs) which also take or leave Mm -hmm. so you know the closest you probably get to this sort of mixture is the film milk which is capitalizing on a lot of the artsy gus van sant stuff but somehow had enough appeal I shouldn't say somehow. It had enough appeal because they pumped budget into right. it. And it was, and, what, two and a half hours long? And lots of people were interested in the story. And it's a good movie. Not to knock any of that stuff, but just to look at where these fall. Because Gus Van Sant's always been one of the most distinct examples of, I have my artsy films, I have my mainstream films. Mm-hmm. Elephant was what you would consider... Art film. Of course. And so Finding Forrester would be... Painfully mainstream. <laughs> what was the other one that was super mainstream too? Goodwill Hunting. Goodwill Hunting. It's odd when you go back and when you watch all of a director's movies uh, from a director you've never seen any of their stuff, and then to try and figure out which were the mainstream ones, you can identify them. They're really easy with Gus Van Sant. Mm-hmm. However, they're not the ones that I remember. Right. And so the ones that might be your favorite as you perform this experiment at home not always the ones that were a huge phenomenal success. Right. So it's curious to look at what made those big successes. And a lot of times that's budget and content and, you know, stuff like milk. Cast and... The studio decided it would be a huge breakout success. It had more advertising. It won some awards. You know, whatever the case may be. We're certainly better at looking at cult films and figuring Mm -hmm. out how those accidentally became successes. Right. Uh, We should pick a mainstream film sometime and just really look into what the fuck... How did, say, a Gus Van Sant mainstream film become a Gus Van Sant mainstream film? But we have some weird middle ground with To Die For. 
What do you feel like are the mainstream elements? What are the artsy elements here? Well, I think that a lot of the mainstream element comes from casting. Then again, this is early Joaquin Phoenix and early Casey Affleck, so we can't chalk them up to big names in casting just yet. But we do have Nicole Kidman. Sure. And we do have Matt Dillon, who at the time was actually popular. If you don't know who Matt Dillon is, he is the husband in the film To Die For. Oh, great. Yeah, he was an actor back in like 1994. I've already forgotten who that is. Again, Um, which one? The husband, Matt Dillon. In the film we watched. To Die For is the name of the film. What was the actor's name? I don't remember. Fuck. So the casting is definitely a huge factor on what makes this a mainstreamy Gus Van Sant film. Right. Also the fact that there's a really cohesive, straightforward narrative. Mm -hmm. But the fact that that narrative gets interrupted by kind of testimonials is, is really... That's the artsy element and the fact that you don't ever really get the full story until the story is finished is another really artsy element to the film. Yeah, it's really strange, the documentary aspects of the film. And I mean, you know, for me, I can look back at a lot of the stuff Gus Van Sant has done and kind of pick out. I mean, we mentioned before on the show the Death Trilogy, Mm -hmm. um, you know, stuff like uh, Elephant, which we did, but also Last Days and Jerry. And I can see Gus Van Sant's interest, and this would really be, you know, a budding interest at the time because he hadn't done any of that stuff right. yet. So this was his first real kind of, I guess there's crime elements to some mm-hmm. of the stuff he does. But I feel like this is, I mean, this is based on the novel, which is based on the court proceedings, which are, you know, an explanation of these killings. I mean, this is true fucking crime that we're talking about. And so I, I see the Gus Van Sant there. I definitely see it there. But then you have some other weird elements kind of thrown in the mix. Right. Uh, the most awesome of which is the ass-kicking Danny Elfman score. Yeah. Holy shit, where did this thing come from? So what's the, put me kind of in the era of, what are we dealing, we're dealing with like 95, so yeah, whereabouts is that? This is just about after the uh, Elfman-Burton divorce. Okay, so we're right in, in that kind of territory. Yeah. So Danny Elfman has kind of been scoring Tim Burton films, and I mean, he's garnered a, enough mainstream success separate from Tim Burton, that he's been doing other films. Right. When we did Ed Wood, we Mm -hmm. kind of talked about how Danny Elfman was notably absent from the score. Right. And this is what he was doing. Imagine Ed Wood with this soundtrack, and now you know why. Yeah, Ed Wood did not have Danny Elfman's score. And so we're dealing with uh, maybe Edward Scissorhands era, but we have this, this grinding guitar, these metal pieces, and this musical saw, which Mm -hmm. I really don't sort of Mars Attacks kind of right. musical saw that's in there, especially the opening credits. Yeah. Just so good. Well, it's almost reminiscent of Funny Games. Yeah, right. Where it's quiet and quaint and we're in fucking Connecticut. And then, <laughs> right. oh my God, rock and roll. Everything's so fucking loud for no reason. Punk fucking rock, man. Resistance, fuck the man, your own path, anarchy. Denim forward, jacket. Forward. Yeah, right. And the music isn't punk rock so much as the kids that are on display right. during the music. But God, just, uh, man, to hear that that grinding guitar Elfman stuff, I want that back. I want to hear more. Well, I don't know if I've ever heard anything like it other than this film. Yeah, I guess this is I mean, his his band in the 80s, Oingo Boingo, had plenty of rock and roll guitar, but not not film score style. I don't, yeah, I don't know about the stuff like this. Although you've heard more of the Oingo Boingo. Mm -hmm. I mean... Have you heard something like this in Oingo Boingo? Not or is so it just, much. It no. just has guitar and that it, there's, makes it. I mean, there's, there's elements, but nothing like that. Does it have musical saw, though, is really the... No, not so much. Without the Danny Elfman, this would be a completely different film. Yeah. And I think so much of a less interesting film. You know, it seems fun and innocent, and then, uh, you know, the score just gives this total change. It's kind of like, um, you know, that, that scene that has Sweet Home Alabama in it. Yeah. And she's dancing and it's just fun outside mm-hmm. and, and you look inside again and then it's a little creepy, but it's still Sweet Home sure. Alabama. And then the score slowly changes. It comes in over the music. It's what the fuck is happening. Yeah. And it's dark and creepy. Yeah. Suddenly that scene, this woman in headlights is dangerous and awful and disturbing when just two seconds ago Sweet Home Alabama was playing. Right. And so there's that tonal shift that happens within the movie, but I think the whole movie would feel weird and airy and just sort of uh, blank without that score. It's a fascinating juxtapose against most of Gus Van Sant's stuff because Gus Van Sant's films are so 
weird firmly, and airy and, <laughs> and well, empty well and, and firmly grounded in realism yeah, yeah everything that goes on in a gus van sant film goes on in real life that's mostly the point of exactly his films. but danny elfman is Except not the one known... with uma thurman and the really big thumbs sorry yeah. go on but danny elfman is not known for his realism he's no. known for his kind of abstractness and his surrealistic portraits of what's going that's why he works with tim burton so well right. is because they have this surrealistic vision of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And when you juxtapose firm realism right. with surrealistic right. score, you get whatever the fuck goes on in to die for where Nicole Kidman seems kind of like a cartoon character that you're scared to death of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She has the, um, both of those elements. She has the cartoonness that makes her a believable person. Right. But that also somehow makes her more real. And sure. the real part of her scares the yeah. fucking crap out of you. She she's it's able she's able to pair between being a cute cartoon and someone you would fuck. Now we're talking about Jessica Rabbit, which we're not gonna hit till the oh, next minute. Sorry, movie. I get that confused. But let's play the game though. Let's just imagine this movie without the Elfman score. Right, because we have the documentary kind of sections, the uh, the testimonial mm -hmm. sort of one off sections. I mean, this would become one of these films that the the type of mockumentary, you know, faux documentary movies yeah. that exist in so great numbers in recent years, and are so. I mean, this doesn't even feel like one of those. Right, the not first at all. time you start to get those scenes, maybe you think about it, but by the end, you would not compare this to a fake documentary. Not at all. That, you know, maybe one we've talked about on the show or the vast number that have been copied and created in various different genres for all sorts of reasons mm -hmm. um, in recent years around the popularization of The Office. Sure. You know, after the Ricky Gervais sure. series and then once it came to America and 150 other countries and you start to see fake documentaries all over the place. This isn't one of those, even though without the score, I mean, it kind of would be one of those. Yeah, it? it absolutely would be. So Nicole Kidman of Fur and of um, what was the other? There was a uh, John Waters with Fur and then there was Eyes Wide Shut that we That's saw right. in on the show. Um, Nicole Kidman gets a little darker. We start to see the cartoony version of her a little differently. But I think the movie has a tonal shift. And I mentioned that Sweet Home Alabama moment, but... Is that a turning point in the film, or do you think it's more gradual? I guess first, do you feel like it gets darker toward the end? I feel like there's there's a clear point. I think it's about the point where um, Matt Dillon, who plays the husband in the film, mm -hmm. he's an actor from the early 90s. Matt Dillon. When he talks to her about the thing that I was telling you drives me crazy, where he tries to include her cute little hobby in his actual real life plan stupid life plan too exactly and he walks out the door and says he wants no one other than his best girl alongside right, him right. that's when you realize she's going to have him killed because you realize that he has now belittled her huge ideals mm -hmm. into a tiny little pigeonhole that he's just going to have her yeah you could like make videos of karaoke and sell right. it to like other people so that's the moment where she doesn't understand him that's kind of where her motivation exactly. start i mean there's definitely an area in the film you know you have um who is it Ileana Douglas right his dummy, sister right we saw her back yeah, in, she's dummy. in dummy oh she was good in that too she's you great know, there's a moment where she kind of breaks down here mm -hmm. that would not work tonally in the beginning of the movie mm -hmm. i mean the the gravity of what people are saying everybody's kind of having a laugh especially the people who work at the tv station um, the guy we saw from Jurassic Park, right. who I won't mention was on that sitcom, but I can't remember the name of the fucking actor. And Matt now Dillon. I feel like a, no, that was somebody else. Oh. He's good in the movie and I'm a prick for not knowing who he is. But, uh, you know, he's joking about what they called her behind her back. Right. What they said about her, the kids all have fond memories of her. And then everything people say, once they start getting to the murder part, sure. once they really have to start answering questions about the murder plot, that's when stuff, you know, that's definitely a darker part of the movie. But yeah, I think you're onto something. That's the origins of her motivations. That Sweet Home Alabama scene, maybe it just sticks out in my head. That's where I kind of think, all right, this the movie is almost split here. Um, it's it's a little more gradual mm -hmm. than to just say part. It's not, you know, autofocus, right. which just somehow becomes dark part of the way through. And you go, what the hell? I didn't sign up for through this. the power of Willem Dafoe. Oh, God, autofocus was awesome. It's not autofocus. It's, uh, you know, they have that conversation in the car. And I kind of wonder, I mean, 
for me, I look at that and I say, where did that idea come from? When she finally says, uh, you should kill him. That doesn't feel like, oh, she's finally put it into words. I get this feeling, maybe it's because I don't often engage in these types of conversations, but I think that came out of left field. Why Uh are we killing him now? Right. Do you get that same feeling? The only reason that I don't get that vibe is because the setup is so clear that he's going to be killed. Right. So by the time... So you're just looking for that. Yeah, by the time they start discussing it, I'm like, okay, now we're talking about what this has clearly been about since the beginning. Yeah. Why they're interviewing all of these people. Mm -hmm. Something happened. The movie is called To Die For. When do we get to the dying part? So this is something I definitely want to explore more. You seem to think that, all right, here was this moment. She realizes she means nothing to this guy. Their relationship is breaking down. To me, I always felt like, you know, certainly a big part of the movie is about her drive to succeed. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like maybe based on the evidence we get later that she had him killed just because she knew it would garner her so much fame. This was it's possible her... too. She has this TV obsession mm-hmm. that we keep seeing on double feature. And I hate, I honestly really despise. Which people. obsession is that the real where it essentially what it comes down to is the real world is television. Oh, if you're not okay. on television, you are not a part of the real world. Sure. Sure. It's in, it's in Oliver Stone's natural born killers. Mm, I feel like that's going to come up again on the show. And we see it again in the other film on the show, serial mom. Mm hmm. But it's just, it's kind of a pain that that's this weird obsession that drives her to do a lot is to try to further her own, I guess, professional career. As You're saying when you see that in people, it drives you nuts that that thing exists, that people would ever fucking believe that. Right. The only people who matter are TV people Mm -hmm. and that we should all idolize them. Sure. Well, that comes from a generation that's a lot more TV focused Mm -hmm. than us. I mean, the previous generation, you know, we grew up with television. But we didn't maybe have the same, um, you know, gather around the TV kind of moments that, you know, here's the first time this is happening on TV and this is happening and and there's politicians on TV and there's late night talk on TV and we're landing on the moon on TV. Mm -hmm. We weren't quite that same generation that idolized people. Whereas Nicole Kimmons character, her generation, you know, the serial mom generation I mean, I guess the Serial Mom, and we'll look at that. That's a more modern court drama kind right. of um, kind of idolizing. But the one we see with Nicole Kidman, she talks about these these news anchors that, especially today, are you know no longer even anchors. But that Edward Murrow, that good night and good luck mm-hmm. uh, kind of generation that sat glued to the the television and all felt like they knew these people, all felt like they loved these people. And so I think that's where that obsession kind of comes from. That's probably true of Natural Born Killers as well. So I guess it's both of those. Yeah. I guess she felt nothing for her husband. And then, I don't know, do you feel like maybe part of it was looking at the fame or was that just a a happy outcome of that? I can definitely see that that was probably factored in. It seemed calculated enough that she knew how she was going to handle everything. From all of the interview stuff we get on the infinite white space, which... Turns out to just be a window in her living room. From all that stuff we get, it seems like the movie's telling us she's obsessed. Mm -hmm. She's driven. It also tells us she's not very bright. But she has one clear focus. And then as we start to see the pieces fill in that story, we see everyone say, yeah, you know what? She was insanely focused. She had one thing on her mind at all times. And so I don't know if you could definitely say, all right, she murdered him because because she could have murdered anyone in the town yeah. in order to get fame. I mm-hmm. mean, that wasn't, you know, it wasn't, I'm going to become a celebrity by murdering someone. That's how I'm going to get my status. But she also felt nothing for her husband. And the second he became even the slightest obstacle, that was it sure. for him. That was the end of it. He was expendable. And so that's a little bit of a weird moment too. You mentioned uh, at the end, things get odd. Yeah. So where about is the the odd portion of the film? Well, this is another one of those hour and 40 something minute films where I could have picked the ending 15 minutes before it ended. Right, right. Where I would have ended the film. Oh, you mean your own, (laughs) build your own ending? Right, exactly. Kind of like um, back on Equilibrium. Sure. And it it always seems to be at about an hour and 30 minutes where you go, that's an ending to the film. Yeah. And so the, um, the hour and 30 minute portion of the movie ends... And then there's just something a little extra. Right. You get the point where they say, and we never saw our daughter again, but then the film cuts to the part where... Could have been the ending. Never saw our daughter again. Exactly. But but then the film gets to the part where the guy who directed The Fly 
uh, puts her under the ice. Cause don't pretend you don't know the name of that guy. That's uh, the part where Mr. David Cronenberg is Italian. Right. Yeah, he's part of the Italian mob, which has been alluded to the entire time. Yeah, hold and- on a second. <laughs> um, David Cronenberg is... First of all, David Cronenberg's Italian? Mm-hmm. When did that happen? Cronenberg. It probably happened around Eastern Promises. Yeah. But that actually came out. A little after, bit slightly more for, Western. And also is not yeah. Italy. I tried. <laughs> But he uh, he puts her under the ice. And... Yeah, he plays Man at the Lake, who is apparently a very important role in what yeah. happens in this story. He's a serious hitman. And he's hired by the family to have her killed. Right. He's hired by like Matt Dillon's parents. Matt Dillon plays the husband. All right. So I buy the ending. I like the ending for one reason and one reason only. Ileana's character then gets to ice skate on Nicole Kidman's corpse. It just makes for the best ending if you're going to look at this as a dark comedy, which is how I'd like to remember the movie. Well, if you're going to end to die for as a dark comedy, I'd hate to see what what stretch you're going to make for (laughs) Serial Mom. Oh, it might just fall under dark comedy as well. Really? Look at that. It might also fall in horror slasher film. The same time. I wouldn't say horror slasher film, but definitely slasher film. I could definitely see that. The uh, the movie really likes its horror slasher film. Oh my God. All of the name dropping that happens over here. Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer and Pee Wee Herman, uh-huh. both in the first, what, minute of the yeah. film. And then there's Blood Feast, right. which, so this is a John Waters movie, Serial Mom. John Waters was actually in the follow-up to Blood Feast several years later uh-huh. called Blood Feast 2. Oh, that's a good uh, title. Some, some, what, 30 years after Blood yeah. Feast was made or whatever. And then there's the Citizen Kane of whatever movies that Blood Feast is called. Yeah. And uh, and Russ Meyer, too. Yeah. There's um, the Russ Meyer video. Mondo Topless. And I love... Here's the thing, right? In the world of John Waters. Now, for normal viewers, uh, maybe people who in our, in our listening audience in Podmanity who are not uh, familiar with Russ Meyer, that kid was just watching porno. Mm-hmm. That's all that was. was you, see porno big, with, you see close-ups of big tits. There are, there's two options, and most people aren't familiar with the second. Yeah, so porno or Russ Meyer. Yeah. And they're a little bit too large where they maybe just kind of cross over, push their way over, if you will, uh-huh. into exploitation territory. The hangover. And that is the, thank you, the giveaway to right. the Russ Meyer. And I love that. I love that we could have just had porn on the TV Instead, we're going to put Russ Meyer on the sure. TV. Just Give because that's shot. the kind of kid this is. That's what Russ Meyer is awesome for. And in the John Waters world, there is no pornography. There's just Russ Meyer movies. I love it. And then after that, there's the reference to uh, Freddie and Jason. Right. Which is oddly in itself a Natural Born Killers reference. Yeah, kind of. I mean, it's around the same time. It just seemed to be a happy mistake. Mm-hmm. Both of those franchises were going strong yeah. in the mid-90s or Barely. so they thought. They were both ending. Yeah, and then after that, we have Texas Chainsaw and uh, you know Annie and Ghost Dad. Yeah. I don't know. Just movies appearing all over the place here. So where the film Polyester that we covered was a John Waters film that was a breed of housewife exploitation. Uh-huh. This is sort of the same thing. Sure, it's kind of the next level. It's, uh, it's a mom has gone, uh, has gone insane with uh, the, the motherly things she expects sure, out of society. Exactly. That sounds like a fine qualifier of housewife exploitation to me. Yeah, I would say so. And so we start this film uh, saying, you know, this film is a true story. The screenplay is based on court testimony, sworn declarations, and hundreds of interviews conducted by the filmmakers. It actually goes on even beyond mm-hmm. that for two more screens to tell you about how they've changed the names of the innocents. And, you to, know, that's to where they preserve a greater truth. <laughs> yeah, I believe the, the a phrase greater is. truth. Like we're going to get into some Freemason shit happening here. It's going to be the Illuminati mm-hmm. appearing in this film. And so that's when it veers from a movie based on actual events into courtroom drama. It's almost more the um, till death do us part breed of. I don't know if you ever saw that. We Actually, we talked about it way back. It was a TV show on Court TV that John oh, right, Waters right. was the, the groom reaper on. It was about marriages that ended in somebody killing the other person. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's that same sort of thing, that fiction that would air on Court TV, those kind of dramas, true crime dramas. Uh, that start as a true story, but also the names are preserved to protect the end. There's some legal mumbo jumbo mm-hmm. kind of thrown in there for suspense. Right. Here's what I love about this. Much like we've talked about with uh, Spun, House of the Devil even. And I think there was maybe something on that Lord of War show, mm-hmm. even though I can't really remember. 
this is just uh, a completely fabricated right based on a true story uh-huh there is nothing true about this story at all not even a little bit true it just says based on a true story and it says that because that's bullshit anyways yeah and you can just make stuff up and so john waters made this joke that it seems like you or i would make in a film that he's just seen so many movies he knows people just say based on a true story and everybody knows that's you know, not factual, but they put it in there anyways, as if that's really going to get more people right. to come to the movie. And so he just threw it in his movie. He thought it was funny based mm-hmm. on a true story. There you go. Names have been changed to protect no one. It's easily in his top three most heinous film premises. What do you of, mean? Of all the films to call based on a true story, aside from maybe A Dirty Shame, Serial Mom is oh, the right. least it's likely the to really yeah. happen. Yeah, especially when they get to the point outside the courtroom They're selling this memorabilia and some of the stuff that's happening. I mean, I guess that's not even the most unrealistic part because that's just supposed to be a a theatrical version of the media circus outside the courtroom. But some of the stuff leading up to it, the way the killings take place, the fact that the guy from Scream is playing his role from Scream in this movie as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of things that are far-fetched in real life. Right. So way back on the, uh, the Pecker episode, the last John Waters film we talked about, you know, uh, harmless fun. Right. Um, the, what was it? The convenience store or grocery store with or whatever. The pictures taking the pictures. That everybody did on Facebook. Here we have what starts with more harmless fun. And this is where you see how harmless fun can turn into, I don't know, stabbing people to death with scissors. Where we have these obscene phone calls. I love these. I love Kathleen Turner and the obscene voice that isn't jessica rabbit we should point that out right yeah so that's what i was talking about in the people skipped <laughs> right. to that movie when i was maybe. talking about fucking know. cartoons right when yeah. you were talking about fucking cartoons i was thinking jessica rabbit uh-huh and that's kathleen turner's yeah, voice. yeah it's her voice really bizarre so i wish i knew more about kathleen turner mm-hmm. because i feel like this would be even more enjoyable if i did but i have to be honest in saying that i haven't seen her in basically anything i haven't seen her in anything outside of who framed roger rabbit right. which was amazing and sure. which we covered on the show and which you should probably watch again at this yeah. point. If if you have if you haven't not seen it since it then, since, yeah. exactly, watch it again. Do it again you right owe now it to yourself. Pause this. Uh, you were talking about Kathleen Turner and her charm, despite being a newbie to your film world. So she's making these obscene phone calls, and she's swearing and using. I mean, fairly tame vulgarities. Sure, but it doesn't even matter what the words are. She's saying to pussy the, willow, right? doesn't matter what the words are to the audience. It matters what they are to her victim. The victim is Mink Stoll. Right. A Another recent one of divo- these. A recent, a recent widow. I was going to say divorcee, but you don't get a choice. Yet she's alone in her house, this poor woman, this sure. poor John it's, Waters actress that shows up all the time. It's when stuff. a stranger calls. Yeah. And, and the calls to her are just... The thing that makes it even more fun, right, is not that you're saying these things that offend the person. I mean, that's pretty good. That's pretty good fun. But what's even better is when she then calls back as the phone company right. and makes her <laughs> recite them. Because the whole idea is that this great John Waters tradition. You look at a taboo and then you force the taboo on the very people who are uncomfortable with it. Right. And that's just what's celebrated so much in John Waters films. That's one of the things I love the most about these movies. It's just this kind of false victory. It makes, it makes me feel like things are better in the world. You know, I think that's to really pin down why I always talk about that why I feel like stuff is right when John Waters is in control. Right. It's just this harmless but completely um, empowering feeling that, oh yeah, people who aren't okay with these social issues, fuck you, you're going to have that shoved in your face. I just feel the sense of victory that's not there right. at all. And so she's then making this woman overcome the very taboos, probably just making them more traumatic for her in effect. By reciting them on the phone. And then she just continues to harass her. Yeah, right. Right, the continued harassment. But this isn't as harmless as photos in the uh, the convenience store. This is, uh, I mean, this, this becomes murder. This becomes serial murder. And that is as much her fetish... As the fetishes yeah, in a dirty shame. Absolutely. I mean, she feeds off that, right? Yeah. She. It's kind of the whole. The whole film is is almost about obsession. I guess mm-hmm. she gets she she gets off on killing people. Right. That's kind of her thing. And and writing her own little wrongs in the sure. world. The the little things that bother her. Right. And and at first she kind of writes it off as doing it for other people. Going back to the Fabergé egg when she Herschel Gordon Lewis's the guy's heart with right. the fire poker. Yeah. Yeah. Um. 
injustice of getting this Fabergé egg, but the end the end result is she just wants to kill people who are wearing white shoes after Labor Day. That's the um that's the glory hole sequence. Right. That there's so much John Waters about that whole part. I mean, so you have the glory hole, another weird taboo uh teabagging sure. kind of thing that John Waters is is telling people about in his movie. There it's almost a mythical idea right the mythical right. idea of the glory hole and so he's going to show it to the audience he's going to say hey look at this weird sexual thing that i've been thinking about and obsessing over and writing and putting in my movie now mm-hmm. and so you know you have the the glory hole in the um in the bathroom and that's the same scene where you have you know that sequence with the fire poker right where she has the fire poker she stabs the guy and then she pulls the meat off it. Yeah. And it's so, the meat, I mean, it looks like it's out of, you know, a Herschel Gordon Lewis. Sure, movie. it looks like it's, Blood Feast. It's, yeah, it's that Blood Feast type of bizarre gore where it's, it just looks like raw steak in some kind of brown, gooey, ah, oh, I don't know how he does it, but Herschel Gordon Lewis <laughs> has the most, dist- you just know it when you see it. Yep. You know that kind of gore. And I think the movie probably knows it's doing that because of so many references to mm-hmm. Blood Feast specifically and to other Herschel Gordon Lewis stuff. But there's another weird thing. Do you remember the sample? That How could you forget the sample right. that comes out of the guy's voice? The StarCraft Command Center sample? Is that where it's from too? Yeah. So I I know I mentioned it on um, on our show before, but it's the, the fucking uh, Real Monsters. Thing. Yeah. If you just YouTube that, it was some bullshit cartoon in the 90s. Yeah, it was a stop motion thingy. Was it stop motion? Or claymation. I thought it was animated. Maybe it was animated, you're right. Neither of us have any idea what we're talking about. But I do remember that sound bite, you know, from the title sequence or commercials that would play or something. And it's very, very distinct. It's a very distinct scream. And this has to be, I mean, we pick up on the sound bank stuff so often, but this has to be one of the most obnoxious obvious uses it's just a man who screams Mm -hmm. rather than being buried in the background say a village is on fire and people are fleeing in terror or something horrifying is happening in a mass crowd of people and it's buried under all the other samples instead it's just this man who walks in and he screams and Mm -hmm. rather than using his scream for whatever reason they use the sampled scream and it's so funny coming yeah, out of him. I don't know if that's because of where I know it well, from. It's just obvious and very deliberate. I mean, you can it's deliberate. see that's you can see John Waters and friends giggling every time that came up in the original edits. Yeah, you know they went through the sound bank and they went up oh, this one. This yeah. one's the funniest. It's almost as if he heard the fucking sound clip of that scream and said to himself, when would you ever need somebody to sound like that? Right. Maybe in a previous movie. And then he put this scene in for that. Right. But yeah, to get back to that, that's her fetish. That's what makes her feel good. You see her light up as a person, you know, after she goes on these killings. I think they even make mention of it after the first one. After she comes home and talks about the the principal, the guy at school or whatever. Right. All the way up into the, uh, the Annie killing. The um, <laughs> lamb shank bludgeoning. Yeah, it's this fucking giant stick of lamb. You know, they talk about the bad influence of family films. And I love that too, mm-hmm. that rather than just defend, as most people do, defend the bloody stuff. If you're a fan of the Herschel Gordon Lewis, the Russ Meyer stuff, you defend it, you say it doesn't harm other people. Rather than do that, John Waters is just going to go on the offense. He's going to say those fucking family Stop films. Stop watching Ghost Dad. Yeah, Ghost Dad is what's fucking up America. And so then there's this choice, kitchen knife or chunk of lamb leg. And for some reason, it's just so much more brutal with the lamb leg. Oh, yeah. I don't know why. Well, and she's hitting her to the beat of the sun will come out tomorrow. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. Which is, I love Annie. I've been trying to get you to do Annie on the show for a long time. We should. We honestly should. Um, But I, just, there's something kind of... It's it's back to the John Waters, like, this isn't dark. It's not creepy or evil. Right, right. It's just, you know, you beat someone with a lamb shank to the tune of Tomorrow by Rodgers and Hammerstein. I don't think it's Rodgers and Hammerstein, actually, but you get my point. Yeah, I know that exact moment. How could you forget that? I just love the selection, the choice, where she has the knife, she's ready to make a stab. You know what? That's not right for the scene. We're going to go with a giant stick of meat. And so he wants to get out his message about uh, family films ruining America. But then there's also some stuff about capital punishment, which I find uh, pretty funny. Right. Not so much capital punishment on a whole, 
but that it's right and Christian. Yeah. You know, there's that great scene where they go in the church after they're followed by a motorcade of uh, police. And they enter the church, and the guy is talking about, of course it's Christian. Jesus was on the cross. Wouldn't that have been a good time to speak up right. if ever there was one? And, you know, then he talks about just do it. I mean, it's it's yeah. practically the Nike slogan. Yeah. Come on, people. Capital punishment. It's just the right thing. We should just get on that right now. And that's the only point of that whole scene. Right after that, they run out. Right. They come in just long enough to hear that moment from the preacher, and then they leave. Mm-hmm. To get into then what becomes more of, uh, I guess, a real true crime, we've never in, you know, in the other John Waters stuff we've done, talked about him employing felons for his right. movies. How do we skip over that? Well, this is probably the best one to talk about. Well, I don't know. You know, we had a little bit more. Oh, I guess we see the same actor in Pecker. Yeah. But yeah, we should cover that here. That's um, Patricia Hearst. Yeah. So Patty Hearst is in, I guess, every movie from Cry Baby on, right? Pretty much. It's, yeah, God, I think it's every single one of them. And she's someone I only really know about her from uh, when Bill Clinton pardoned her. I think it was the last thing he did as president. Uh-huh. But um, she was she was picked up by this liberation front, right? She's the daughter of... Um, she's a granddaughter, granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst. So she was kidnapped by some kind of liberation front. And uh, I don't know. This is kind of a new fascination uh-huh. of mine. I've been looking into this a lot more before we did the show. Um, she was kidnapped by this group. And I don't know the exact details. So I'm not even really sure about how I feel about Patricia Hearst as a person. Uh-huh. It's amazing that she's in these movies. That I feel incredible about. Right. But that's all John Waters. But yeah, I don't, I don't know if I like her or not. She, uh, I guess she kind of befriended the group. Sure. If that's to be believed. Again, don't really know the details. But, you know, if we'll kind of believe the the narrative that most people seem to buy into, she befriended this group. She was sympathetic towards the cause of her kidnappers. Uh-huh. And so she robbed a bank with them. And I guess she pleaded differently. And, you know, her sentence wasn't very long. But there are these great photos. If you just uh, Google Patty Hearst or Patricia Hearst or whatever, you might need to throw her middle name in there. Just look her up. You'll see the stuff in Google Images. There are these great shots of it's it's like black and white footage from a bank robbery and then a shot of a john waters movie Mm -hmm. and then her screaming at some people with a you know carbine rifle and then another john waters film and it's just an even mix of you know footage from a bank robbery or footage from the the crime spree stuff or whatever the news articles i guess that were coming out at the time and then interspersed with all of the the acting career so Jimmy Carter gave her a, a shorter sentence, or I don't remember exactly what happened there. And then um, Bill Clinton was the one who officially just nullified the record or whatever that means to be. Yeah. Pardoned after your release from prison. He, yeah, I guess that's what happened. And because he technically, I think he pardoned her even after she was in the movies. Uh-huh. Right. Because that, yeah. that would have had to make sense. Because sure. um, crybaby. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. So, yeah, I'm just going to continue to play. Politics elude us here on this Serial Mom show. Thank you. No one should be expecting this of me. But now she shows up in this movie. She was in Pecker as, uh, who, what was her role in Pecker? I don't remember. She was just one of the New Yorkers the who grabbed her tits. Sure, sure. She was the yeah, tit grabbing New Yorker. Yeah, I remember that, where the guy comes up and he says, I love your tits or whatever. Sure. And uh, in this movie, she is juror number eight. Mm. So now John Waters is on such friendly terms with former convict, former felon, and not the only felon sure. he's employed. Right. Not the only one in his films. But um, he's on such good terms with her, he can force her into a courtroom, which must be kind of awkward, uh-huh. right? To be a juror. Although he probably thinks there's something fitting sure. and, uh, right. and comical Absolutely. about that, which there, which there clearly is. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, she gets killed. So this is another big John Waters staple. We have a trial yeah. in this movie. A nonsensical happens Total at, circus. at the end of the movie, yeah. media circus uh, trial. John Waters has a huge fascination with these things. I don't know why. I'm not sure what the draw is, but I, I, you know, I can kind of see it. When he talks about, you have to read John Waters' interviews. Right. They're amazing. Um, just see him interviewed, see him in documentaries. He's in a ton of them. But to watch him talk about court trials and his fascination with that I suddenly feel like I love court trial, Mm -hmm. even though I don't give a shit at all. I don't care about this. I've been spending a week reading about Patty Hearst. I don't, yeah, of what what interest is that to me? But I hear John Waters talk about it, 
And then suddenly I am just as enthusiastic about it. It's mm-hmm. amazing. So he puts a trial in this movie here. And that's really where Patricia Hearst came from. For sure. Him. It was his interest in all of this court, crime drama, true crime, all of that stuff. You know, and by having that fascination, he brought that actor in his movies even before he even had a courtroom scene for. Her. But what this effectively does for the movie, besides examining the courtroom and being more farcical and making more humor, and bringing out of in it, Suzanne Summers and bringing Suzanne, well, and apparently Kathy Bates as yeah, well. Kathy Bates. I did not spot the Bates. Like, <laughs> that's a harder game. Um, she has an uncredited role. I guess it's kind of rumored. I don't know the exact details. I can't find Kathy Bates at the end, but apparently she's there. So says the internet. And as we know about what's that chick's name from the Devil's Rejects who we couldn't find? Yeah, that girl. Um, the internet always correct. Okay, so I actually watch the Devil's Rejects four or five times a week. Whoa! So is there progress here? Yeah, she's the nurse that gets stabbed on oh, the road. No way. Yeah. Oh, you found her. Good. Thanks for following up on that. You're I appreciate welcome. that. So the other effect this has, the big effect for me, the one I love, is that you get a chance to review earlier in the film. It's like your conclusion paragraph of your fucking three point essay, right? You get to say, look back at what happened. Well, we, we had some fun. We had some laughs. Wasn't this a good time? Certainly some people died, but all in the honor of a greater truth. Yeah, a greater truth. And so it's like you get to go back and convince your audience that this actually was a great movie. You might have already forgot some of the good moments. Let me replay them for you before they actually leave. It's such a William Castle-esque. Yeah. I mean, it just makes so much sense for John Waters. It's perfect. All right, so that's what? That's our second John Waters show this year? Yeah. That's probably enough for one year, right? Well, we're kind of running out of time. I guess it'll have to be enough then. Oh my God, we're going to be in year four of this If you want to watch more John Waters movies, then you would have to be a winner of our donation contest. Yeah, something Uh, like that. You're welcome to email us and tell us to watch more John Waters movies at doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. We won't listen. Also, I'm pretty can, sure we're going to do it anyway. Yes, so. that's true. You're better off just, just... By coincidence, we will totally listen just Send us time. all of your suggestions so you can pat yourself on the back and tell all your friend when we uh, finally do the, the film you recommended to us. Hey, good job. Congrats. Otherwise, you can check out the other stuff we did at DoubleFeatureShow.com. Such a back catalog now. So many awful, 154 shows, awful actually, shows is where we are. We should take those down. Um, but we're going we're gonna to keep doing shows. We're going to do another show next week. Oh my God. I told people this has been a long time coming. Maybe they didn't believe us. Um, or maybe they skipped right from the beginning. Hey, welcome to the show. Uh, you should go back because that show turned out pretty fucking good. Mm-hmm. So go listen to that. That Okay, so what is it? What are we're we gonna doing? We're going to do Harry Brown. Uh-huh. And then we're going to do Children of Men. Now, I know what you're thinking. Whoa, whoa. A Michael Caine double feature for Children of Men. That's inappropriate. Here's the deal. All right, what is it? We watch... Okay, so this is what this next show will be show 155, ah, which means like we've watched at minimum 310 films, not including Killapalooza. Oh, so many movies. Sometimes when you pick two films, the same actor is in them. <laughs> yeah, you have to deal with that and just get around. We're not doing a Michael Caine double feature. Turns out actors do multiple films. We didn't even realize it when we paired it up. We went finally great, and then there was about half a second, and you went fuck Michael Caine in both yeah. of the movies. And we didn't want that to seem like that's the focus because we've been trying to do Children of Men forever. Harry Brown is also pretty fucking good. Yep. And I think it's different enough that no one will, there won't be any weighing the two movies versus each other or anything weird like that. It just fits so well for all sorts of other reasons that we have to ignore the fact that it looks like it's highlighting the career of Michael Caine. We love Michael Caine. We'll do a Michael Caine centric episode when we do Alfie and Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Oh God. But right now, you're just going to have to watch more fucking film. Goodbye.